Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Addicted Mind podcast. My name is Dwayne Osterlin, and I'm your host. Today, our guest is Stephen D., and he is going to talk about a very important topic, parenting a child with addiction. Stephen D. is the father of five children, the youngest of whom had a near-lethal addiction to alcohol. Steve retired from a 30-year career on Wall Street to learn about addiction, to help his family, and to help others. His eight-year journey includes getting trained as a parent-peer addiction coach, completing a fellowship at Harvard University studying addiction, co-creating a podcast called My Child and Addiction, and volunteering at a national addiction nonprofit to create educational tools for families. He is the author of Love the Kid, Hate the Disease, Lessons Learned from a Father Dealing with His Son's Addiction, and a website called addictionlessons.com, a website dedicated to sharing the best of what he learned to help other parents. So Steve is going to share a little bit of his own story and the lessons he learned along the way. Before we start, I want to thank everyone who has left a review on iTunes. I really do appreciate it. It means so much to me to know that the Addicted Mind podcast is having a real positive effect on so many people. It really blows me away. When I started this podcast, I didn't realize the impact it would have. And I am so touched that this podcast has helped so many people. So if it's helping you think about writing a review, I really appreciate it. And also, you can now find us on Instagram at the Addicted Mind podcast. So check that out as well. All right, all my wonderful listeners, stay tuned for this episode. All right, everyone, we have Steve D on the podcast today, and we're going to talk about, I think, a very critical topic, and that's parenting a child with addiction. And Steve is going to share some of his story and some of the lessons that he's learned in going through that journey with his own child. So Steve, you want to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you so we can get to know you and and let's jump into some of your story and the lessons that you've learned. Sounds great. So yeah, so uh, I'm the father of five children, the youngest of whom had a very severe addiction to alcohol, which uh, nearly killed him four times by the time he was 17. And it's really two stories. I mean, his story is an unbelievable journey. You know, he's now 25. He's seven and a half years sober. It was a really, really dark time for him when he had addiction. And now he's thriving, living a very connected, happy, productive, empathetic life. And I couldn't be more proud. So my journey was was a lot different as the parent. I was living the dream, working on Wall Street. I had a big job at Morgan Stanley running global trading businesses. I was on the management committee of the firm. And then this grenade went off in the middle of our kitchen, literally, you know, my son's addiction. And what I decided to do, because the job that I had was so intense, was actually to retire and to really dig in, go all in and learn everything that I could about addiction to help my son, to help me and my family, which were all struggling. And then ultimately to kind of create a second career where I would spend my time in a mission to help other people that are dealing with the same problem. And that's what I'm doing today. Wow. And I would imagine, you know, like you said, that grenade goes off in your kitchen. You were pretty into your work, into your job. I'm imagining kind of thinking, okay, you know, we got kids, but, you know, we're going okay. And then boom, this blows up. How did that happen? Well, how did it happen? So, I mean, you know, the root cause for my son is probably, you know, it's genetic. You know, he had his first drink. It was an amazing experience for him as he describes it. He had, you know, low level anxiety and depression and all of a sudden he felt pretty good and he became a big social animal. But it happened really quickly. I mean, he probably had his first drink at 14 by 16 He had 10 of the 11 symptoms on the DSM-5, which means he had full-blown, big-time addiction. And it had all the manifestations. You know, he became a liar, a manipulator. He was very confrontational. We had to call the police a couple of times. 
it was extremely disruptive in the family. It almost blew apart my marriage. I mean, it was it was a full time deal as a parent, trying to understand what's going on, trying to just get my head around it. And yeah, I mean, that's how it all started. And of course, the whole time, I'm just so worried about my kid because I just don't yeah. see any path, any solution for him to to be healthy. Right. That has to be so incredibly scary as a parent because you can feel so helpless on what to do, like not even know where to go, how to get help, what to expect, all of that stuff. So you've also are the author of the book, Love the Kid, Hate the Disease, Lessons Learned from a Father Dealing with His Son's Addiction. And so all of this experience you've started to to put down for other parents out there who are going through that experience and, and doing that. So I want to start to talk about a little bit of these, these lessons that you've learned so that other parents can, you know, understand, you know, what, what to do. It's, it's so terrifying. Uh, there's no doubt. I mean, you know, I sat there when he first began treatment and I literally could, you know, as a can do optimistic human on every level, I just sat there and said, there's no path. I have no hope. I have, I'm helpless. And, you know, that's where I started. And that is not where I am today. So I would love to talk about the things that I actually wished I knew when I first began the process, which is what the basis is of these stories. You're right. And I, you know, before we go forward, I was just thinking, I want to acknowledge all the parents out there that have lost their children to addiction as well, whose children didn't make it. And I just want to acknowledge that too, because, you know, with this opioid epidemic, you know, if you're out there and you've lost a child, I just want to acknowledge the, the pain and how painful maybe even listening to this episode could be. So I just want to acknowledge that before we move forward, because there are parents that didn't didn't get to see their kids get to the other side. So, yeah. but any, thank you, anyway. Th thank you for that, because I agree with you. It could have been me. And yeah. just, you know, by the grace of God, you know, I pray every night and thank the Lord. But for those people, my heart, it bleeds for them, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So let's go into your lessons that you learned and what you started to discover. Because like you said earlier, this grenade goes off in your kitchen and it's like, what in the world do I do? I don't even know what to do. I'm like you said earlier, I'm a banker. I, I work at Morgan Stanley. I don't, I don't know anything about this stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, it starts with understanding that there is hope. And, yeah. you know, so I also volunteer at Northwell Health. I work with the clinicians and the families. And literally everybody comes in the same way I came in, came in hopeless. And the, the fact of the matter is, as you know, because you're in the business, people do get sober, people do get healthy, yeah. people do gain recovery. And Absolutely. the other side is, you know, if, if people get there is amazing. And so, you know, I sat there and I was hopeless and I was helpless. And, you know, we came off a very difficult period where my son ended up in a psychiatric unit for a week and then in with extreme depression and then ended up, you know, at a outpatient clinic. And I just, I didn't see a path and I was wrong. There are paths. There are things that can be done. There is a way to get to the other side. And there are people who are young who get in recovery, who are in their 20s, 30s, you know, teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 90s. You know, I've heard people, you know, 80s and 90s getting in recovery. So there's always hope. That's absolutely. the first lesson, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that you said that. There, there are paths out there. There are people willing to help you like you you know, willing to help you guide who've been there, have done it, who've walked through it. Yeah. And listen, the, the other thing is there's people like you, and I know you can't say that, but I can. The professionals that we worked with were incredible because a lot of people, like even myself, I thought I could solve this problem on my own. And what you realize quickly is you don't have any toolkit. You, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you don't know. You don't have the experience. It's like a doctor never operates on their own kid. Well, it's the same with addiction. And so 
you know, getting professionals on our team was a game changer. And, you know, that and experienced parents and listening to their stories, we just had a lot of resources. Some were free, some, you know, were required insurance, but, you know, we got, that was a big deal. It's a big lesson to not to try and do it on your own, not be isolated. A lot of people feel shame and stigma. You kind of have to open up and tell somebody that you yeah. have an issue. Yeah. And I, I think that stops so many people from getting help. Even the, the person who's maybe struggling with addiction as well, doesn't want to get help, doesn't want to do anything because of all that shame and that stigma. And then being able to talk about it helps break that pattern. Without a doubt. And yeah, I mean, the parental shame and stigma is one thing, you know, with my son, he didn't want to get help because he didn't, he didn't think he had a problem and he didn't, you know, he didn't want to change what he was doing. And that's also the case with a lot of people who have addiction is they don't know any other way. And, you know, their brains are telling them using drugs and alcohol is the way to go. And that's where my son was in a big way. I mean, he was clearly in a place where he was railing against any kind of help. Wow. So what did you do with that? Like, how, how do you handle that as a parent? You can see it and probably other people on the outside can say, man, this kid needs help and he doesn't want to get it. He doesn't want to do anything about it. How do you handle that as a parent? Well, I handled it poorly at first. <laughs> you know, the first thing we did was we got him into treatment, which was good. But, you know, he kind of dominated the household he railed against it. He pushed back. He started saying things like, well, you're the reason why I'm depressed. You're making me do these things that I don't want to do. And it kind of got me back on my heels in a big way. And so I wasn't doing what the clinicians were saying you need to do, which is to set boundaries, to you know, make sure that there are natural consequences you know, so that they can see that the problem is real. And in the beginning, you know, I would say that the sickest person in the, in the family was running the household. And, you know, it's not right. just in my household. It's because, you know, it's a very extreme set of behaviors and people don't know how to deal with it. And the way I dealt with it was I didn't want confrontation. And so I just backed up and he kind of got what he wanted for, you know, the first period of time. And then... I listened. I listened to the professionals. I listened to experienced parents. And I started to crack down on what I needed to do as a parent, which is what I said, which is set boundaries on what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And if the boundaries are broken, make sure there are consequences so that he could actually see that if he was using and he wasn't supposed to be using, that the consequences were real and had an impact and were affecting him. So that was the beginning of, of our journey was at first I did a bad job. And then, and I think most people have a hard time with, with the change. And then, you know, I started to listen to the professionals. So you have to kind of get out of your own way sometimes, you, you know, we want to protect our kids from pain. We don't want them to experience some of these horrific boundaries that might happen because of their own choices or substance use. And then we, don't set any boundaries and they, you know, their addiction can flourish without consequence. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's exactly right. You know, with my older four kids, you know, we didn't have to do any of this and it worked out. So for me on the fifth kid, you know, I, I had to really learn a new way of parenting and because it wasn't working what I was doing you right, know, with my older right. kids, I was enabling them to do all the things they wanted to do sports and, you know, activities and, you know, whatever it was. And if they had problems, I would work with them. But here the problems were addiction related. And so solving those problems and making life easy for him, using alcohol and behaving the way he was, was upside down. It was not what I was supposed to be doing. And it took a while for me really to see it. And the way I saw it was really empathetic, experienced parents kept saying to me, well, if you make life easy for him, why would he change? Like, if you keep fixing his problems, how is he going to see that there's a problem? And the truth was, he couldn't see it because I kept, you know, running interference on the problems. 
Right. Almost protecting him from his own consequences of natural consequences from his behavior. Exactly right. What about all the other family members in this? Like, so you're starting to set these boundaries. And you also said, you know, your marriage almost blew up because a lot of parents together trying to do this, it's hard to get on the same page about setting these boundaries. It can be, can feel different for each parent, also siblings, all, all of that as well. Yeah, it's brutal. So yeah, I mean, the issue with my wife and I was that we looked at the same problem and her answer was chain him to his bed. <laughs> Don't ever right. let him leave the house. My answer was, well, let's have conversations and let's negotiate and, you know, let's see if we can, you know, work some things out. And, you know, of course, I thought I was saving his life and she thought she was saving his life. And if you think you're saving your kid's life, then, you know, you're willing to fight with your spouse. And that's where we were. We couldn't agree. We were on opposite ends. And at one point, our four older kids actually sat us down and said, you're not helping anybody. You're going to, you're going to get divorced. You're going to blow up the family. They did an intervention, not for our kid, not for Stevie, but for us. And we realized that this was a big problem. And, you know, I, I definitely had a problem with thinking I was right (laughs) all the time. And so what I decided to do was to, just have my wife make the decisions and that I would go along and support her decisions so we could be on the same page so that he couldn't play one off the other. What was really interesting about that was as soon as I gave in and said, you know, honey, you're going to make the decisions. I'm going to support your decisions. I trust you. She moved from the chain to his bed to somewhere in between in the middle to where both of us were, which is where we should have been all along. And so we had the capability of coming up with the right answer, but it was just, it was all about us battling each other and not coming together to solve the problem. And that solved it. So that was one issue. The other one kind of surprised me. And that was the impact on the older kids. When Stevie's addiction really reared its ugly head, he was a junior in high school. Three of the older siblings were in college and one was already out of college. So my view was they have been insulated and they're fine. We ended up going to a family education weekend at the treatment center that he was at for residential. And I mean, it just came out. There was more tears. There was more guilt. There was more upset. You know, my daughter actually started the whole process, you know, by introducing herself to the larger crowd of families that were there. You know, me, I I think I feel like I've lost my baby brother forever. We had an amazing relationship. We don't even talk now. And the whole room broke down and cried because everybody realized that there was some element of that in all the families. And so as that weekend went on, you know, one of my kids was felt guilty about supplying him with alcohol. They were pissed that there was such an impact on on us, my wife and I. There was just so many elements that right. came out. It was obvious that this insulated these insulated kids who were almost on their own were still impacted. So it just was a signal to me that the impact on families, if you're actually living together all the time, is probably going to be even bigger. Yeah. Yeah, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking about how for your journey, you you had to really open up, let go, and listen and do these things where you go to these treatment centers and the whole family is talking about this and how big that is. But like really being able to step back and allow that process to happen, because that can be scary enough in and of itself. Right. Because, we, yeah. you know, what are we going to find out? Intense. What are people going to say? It's better to just, you know, not say anything. And Well, there was a moment where, you know, the the patients had to talk about their relationships and where they were before addiction and where they were after addiction. And invariably, you know, the, the relationships were good before and frayed or really bad after addiction. But at one point, my son said, you know, my dad gave up on me and I was sitting there like oh my god like how could he think I gave up on him and what had happened was when he was in eighth grade 
we took him to see a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist said to us, he's really hard on himself. He's got low level depression. You need to back off and really not put any pressure because he's putting a ton of pressure on himself. And, you know, we had a pretty high, you know, functioning family. And, you know, there might have been a little bit of like pressure to do well in school and that kind of stuff. So I immediately put the brakes on and didn't put any pressure on him. His interpretation was I gave up on him. Wow. And so what was amazing about this family event was that we got to get to the bottom of something that was really big in his life and was actually a misinterpretation of what I was doing. And so it was just an incredible opportunity to kind of break down some really big things that were standing in the way of relationships and that were impacting our family. Wow. So really started to open up this deeper level of communication between each other so that Without healing could take place. Yes. Yes. And, and it, it really has. So the siblings were all kind of you know upset with him. I think largely most of that has dissipated and they're really proud of him. You know, I mean, it's kind of, he's 25, he's got a great job. He's the happy go lucky sweet kid that he was before addiction. Everybody's really kind of amazed, particularly since he was sober for nearly four years in college, which is a big deal. I mean, that's, that's a lot considering what the culture is in a lot of these campuses. And so, you know, they're looking at their little brother and saying, wow, he's, he's done some amazing things and they're proud of him. Wow. I mean, it sounds like just getting, you know, we're just touching the tip of the iceberg of your story and, and there's so much more in it. But I want to also move to how you've taken this experience and are really working to help others. And you created a website called addictionlessons.com. And you've taken this experience, because we've talked earlier about this before you came on, but you've taken this experience and put it into that process. And, and let's hear about that, because I, I think that's that's an amazing story, too, and just more hope. Yeah. So it turns out that it was a little over a year ago that I was working as a full-time volunteer at a national nonprofit called Shatterproof, and I was responsible for education. And one of the marketing people said, we want personal stories. We want people to write blogs. So I went to the library, and I started to write a story. And then I realized that as a parent, I was in a very unique and privileged position insofar as in this journey, I've had all this experience with my son, personal experience, which is important. I had, I spent a year and I went to Harvard University and I studied psychopharmacology, neuroscience and public health around addiction. I spent four years at Shatterproof building educational materials. I still volunteer and, and it keeps it fresh with Northwell working with families. And so doing all these things, it's like, no, you got to do more. You can't just write like 500 words. You have to write down all the things that you think people need as parents. And so that's what I did. I started writing it down and I was informed by my, my experience and what I was missing. But every week when I would go to these meetings, I would see these families come into Northwell and I'd see the same things, no hope, head spinning, you know, no idea what kinds of tools they could use in the household to change what's happening with the sickest person running the household. And so I started to write down stories and it ended up being 12. And the 12 stories, the first five are really science, you know, and, and hope and things like that, uh, which includes the stages of change. So, you know, that story is really important because when you're going through this, you don't know where you are. You're blind. You don't know what the process is. And I didn't. And you don't know what relapse means. And, you know, where is my kid in the process? How long is it going to take? Can we get this done in a week? You know, right, that's kind right. of the thought. But no, you can't get it done in a week. It takes a while. So I started writing these stories. And then the back part of it gets really personal. So, you know, I write down what, what parents can do to help, but I start talking about like, what are the common traps? And for me, 
the common traps were that my son used lying, manipulation, confrontation, splitting my wife and I to get what he wanted. You know, so in lying, he would look me square in the eye and say, I'm looking you right in the face and telling you that I did not drink. I can't believe my own father doesn't believe me when I'm looking you square in the eye. Right. And he was lying because that's what you do. You hide when you have a problem like this. So I started writing, you know, about those traps and what I needed to do. I needed to change my parenting approach. I needed to learn about detachment. So I need to separate the disease and the manifestations of the disease from my kid who I love, right? So I have a soft spot in my heart. So if he's lying to me, well, you know, he's just a teenager. No, that's addiction lying to me. And now I need to do what I need to do. So there's that. And it just kept going like with these lessons. The interesting thing about it is the lessons only take 40 minutes to read. There's 12 of them. They're like one to three minutes a piece. And I tell personal stories. So in boundaries, consequences, and leverage, which are your primary toolkit for creating change, you know, I tell the story about telling my son that, you know, if the treatment providers recommend a residential treatment, we're going to take him out of high school and we're going to send him. Well, he did have a big relapse and we had a big confrontation and You know, it was bedlam in my house. And, you know, ultimately I had to confront him and it was really hard for me. I mean, it's probably the hardest thing I ever did in my life was to tell him that if they recommended residential treatment, I'm going to make you go. And so I tell the stories and then we talk about what are the tools, how do they work and things like that. So really what it is, big picture, is everything that I wish that I knew about addiction before the whole thing started so that I had a kind of a universal idea of what the science was, that, that what the outcomes could be, what the process was, what are the tools that I need in the household, and all infused with my personal stories, which are pretty gritty and pretty nasty at times. Yeah. I mean, I think... Th- you know, the stories to put them out in that way in a in a real like down to earth, heartfelt way, make them relatable, make them understandable, so that, you know, a parent who's going through this can can hear themselves in the story. Like you were talking about your daughter sharing in that meeting, everybody could relate. There's some universal themes that are part of addiction. That really, when we're in shame and and trapped in that stigma, we don't realize like there's all these commonalities that anybody, any family who's going through addiction is going to experience. And it's not craziness. It's, It's this disease that just rips things apart. There's no doubt. I mean, you nailed it. The, you know, one of the main recommendations is something that I railed against. You know, people said to me, you need, you need to go to a parent support group meeting. And right. I just sat there and I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I am not going to a parent support group meeting. It's ridiculous. And then it turns out that after I went, after about three meetings, I realized that my story was not unique. There were people who could support me and help me understand what was going on. There were tools that people had used and hearing it from an experienced parent was unbelievably effective because their kid's life was on the line, right? Their family's, right. you know, cohesion was on the line. They tried it and it worked. They tried other things that didn't work. And so, yeah, I mean, that's the thing is, You have to become, you know, for me, I had to become vulnerable. I had to be okay with going into a meeting and telling people that I screwed up, that I didn't know what I was doing, and I didn't have all the answers. And funny thing is, everybody else was doing the same thing. Right. And together, together with the help of clinicians, we got to a place where we didn't feel alone. We felt like we had some tools in our toolkit. And we felt really good about being able to help the next person coming into the meeting. So there were a lot of elements which were amazing about, you know, about going to those support group meetings that I never would have guessed. And almost everybody who comes in, comes in the same way. 
They come in hopeless. They come in feeling alone. They come in feeling that their situation is unique. And after three weeks, they know that 90% of what they're dealing with, other people are dealing with. There might be some unique components, but 90% is the same. They don't feel yep. alone and they start to feel like they can get a little bit of control about what's happening in their house. Yeah. And I think like you said, that key, like having that willingness to just be a little bit vulnerable to reach out to these resources and step out of the shame step out of the guilt and and get that support. I, I think that's just so critical for anyone dealing with any kind of mental health issue because like you said, yeah, 90%, it's, it's really all the same and other people have gone through it and they understand right. it. Like, like you, like you can share your wisdom. Like I've been there, I've done that. Not only do I have some ideas that you may not have thought of, I also understand how it feels to be in that position. And I think that's so critical too, because you can feel so alone. Yeah. And the way I share is I always tell people I'm not a professional and people should know I'm not, you know, I'm not you, Dwayne, you are a professional. I am not, but I will tell them my story and what I did and, and what was going on in my life going on and, you know, emotionally for me and what the outcomes were and you can take or leave what I'm telling you. And that's powerful for people, you know, to lay it out there and to just tell people, look, you know, this may or, you know, work with your professional, but this is what I did. And it's always, I always did things that were recommended by the professionals because you guys know, right? You guys have been there a thousand times, but it's really hard to pull the trigger. So when another parent has pulled the trigger, on certain things and it's worked out, it makes it easier for the next person to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, when you get that peer support, it sometimes is more helpful than a professional in certain ways because, you know, you can relate, you understand, and it enables the person to go, okay, you know, maybe I can do that. Maybe I can try that. Maybe I can see if that will work and, and do that. Yeah, and that's exactly the idea of the stories is, you know, and I say, look, I'm not a professional in the stories too, because I want people to be clear. You know, I have gone all in. I've learned a lot. You know, I do these, you know, these parent support group meetings every week, but I'm not a professional, but this is what I tried. And this is what was going on in my life. And this is why I was scared out of my mind to even try it. And this is what happened. And that's what it's about. And, and here are the takeaways. These are the things to think about, the concepts, the information, the tools, and the stories all together to help you understand things that are important about addiction, things that make addiction different. Yeah, yeah. And, and tell me a little bit about going through all this, how it's enriched your life to give people hope because in the middle of it, you can't. You can't see that part of it when you're in the midst of it. It's just hurt and pain and fear and shame and all of that. But when you can get to the other side and get into recovery and experience the benefit of your son's recovery, the benefit of, if you want to call it your own recovery, if that makes sense, how, how has it now enriched your life? Well, so, the, so I'll talk about two things. One, the people in recovery. You know, I've been blessed to be able to go to open AA meetings, anniversary meetings for my son. And the energy, the gratitude, just the, the beautiful humanity, the connection between people in those meetings. It's just an unbelievable, these are unbelievable events. There's so yeah. much happiness. There's so much because when people go to the depths of where that disease takes them and they emerge healthy, it's absolutely breathtaking. And so there's that side. For me, you know, it humbled me. I mean, what can I tell you, right? Yeah. You know, I got humbled at Morgan Stanley. I was a problem solver. The biggest problems were my problems to deal with. And this was one that I was completely ill-equipped. And I would say I was a perfect mark for the disease. Somebody who yeah. thought he could handle it, right, who had no professional experience, 
I was an easy mark and I, I was humbled. I had to do things that I never did before, which was be really vulnerable and say, I don't have the answers or I screwed up or, you know, I did my best, but it wasn't good enough. You know, that, that was hard for me, but the thing about it now is what I can tell you is I get calls all the time. I get calls from people. And by the way, it's anywhere from somebody who's a billionaire to someone who's on Medicaid. It's everybody. It's a very democratic disease. It yeah. really is. It Doesn't impacts care. every single strata of the world. But what's really, and I do all this stuff, like I wrote the website and I know that's touching a lot of people because I have a survey and the feedback's unbelievable. You know, I, I have a podcast It's called My Child and Addiction. It's cool. These are all big, scalable things. I have to tell you, the most gratifying and incredible work that I do is working with the families directly. There's no feeling like it, you know? And so I was educated and professionally kind of trained to do scalable things, but it's the tiny scale. It's the one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. it's the, you know, the small groups that is just awesome. And I love it. So I'm never going to give that up. I'm going to do it as long as they'll have me in the meetings. There, there is nothing like watching other people thrive when, you know, it's just, it's amazing. It's, it's the greatest, it's, greatest gift it's to get. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and that's, that's the other thing that I learned is me being allowed to help someone else is a gift to me. Yeah. It's like yeah. everything with addiction feels like it's upside down, but it absolutely is a gift to me. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Wow. Steve, thank you so much for coming on to the Addicted Mind. Before you go, I always like to ask one question. And if maybe there's a parent out there listening to you right now, and you could tell them one thing to do, you could tell them one thing, what would you want to tell them? Well, what I would tell them is take a deep breath and get professional help that's the awesome. starting point honestly and you know i mean to me there are four things that parents can do that's the first one the most important one the second one is to get support these meetings where you're with professionals and experienced parents are life-changing honestly really work on getting educated and actually the last one is one i did a really poor job Dwayne. And, and clinicians like you tell people all the time to do this, and that's to take care of yourself. And I just didn't do it. And I wasn't at my best when I needed to be at my best. And that's the argument for it. The argument against it is, how can I take care of myself when my kid is so sick? But it's a marathon and not a sprint. And I needed to be better at certain times. And I wasn't. And it was because I didn't take care of myself. Oh, thank you, Steve, so much for, for sharing that wisdom. Can you give out, where, where can people find you? Where can people find you? If they want to get a hold of you, want to know more about you, where can they go? You, well, I think the place to go for the content is addictionlessons.com. That's the best place to go because I lay it all out there. Everything that I can give is right there. Awesome. And I will include that link or any other links that you give me in the show notes at theaddictedmind.com. Steve, thank you so much for coming on and just doing what you're doing. Well, thank you, Dwayne, for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Addicted Mind podcast. I hope you got a lot out of our conversation with Stephen D. As usual, all the show notes will be at theaddictedmind.com and all the links will be there as well. So go check that out. And don't forget, if you enjoyed this episode of the Addicted Mind podcast, click subscribe so you can get the most latest episodes downloaded directly to whatever podcast software you use. And you can find us on Instagram at Addicted Mind Podcast. So check that out. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And I'll talk to you on the next episode.